Um, my name is uh, Ian Loder, I'm Director of the Oxford Centre for Phrenology and it's um, my pleasure this afternoon merely to be hosting, um, hosting um, INSA. Um, this is the um, 18th Annual Roger Hood Lecture. Um, we inaugurated this lecture back in 2006 um, to honour the significant role that Roger Hood had played in both the formation and development of criminology in this university as Director for the Centre for Criminological Research for over... 30 years, um, as well as for his wider contribution to the field of criminology in Britain and internationally um, over that period, on many, many topics, most obviously um, the death penalty. Um, over that 18 years, this lecture has become um, a significant, um, a kind of significant event in the kind of annual calendar of the centre, um, one we look forward to, we can get a chance to party, we get to hear interesting speakers. Um, and this year will be no different. Um, as most of you in the room, I suspect, will know, Roger is sadly no longer with us. He passed away in 2020. But his influence on the centre continues to be felt, um, most obviously, but by no means only in the work of the Death Penalty Research Unit, headed up by Professor Caroline Hoyle. And it is our pleasure to continue this lecture um, now um, in his name and in his honour. Um, as I say, my principal job today is to introduce and chair the lecture, um, which will be delivered this year by Professor Inter Cock, who's Professor of British Cultures. What a, what a great job title that is. Do you think so? <laughs> I think I'm it's terrible. Of, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, maybe <laughs> <laughs> we'll, just, we'll, discuss that, <laughs> we'll discuss that afterwards. Okay. Um, <laughs> it has the unfortunately named title, The Professor of British Cultures. <laughs> At the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. Um, prior to that, Insa was the Associate Professor in Law and Anthropology at the London School of Economics. Um, she is originally of this parish. Um, Insa did her um, DPhil in the law faculty here. Um, the book of the DPhil was published as Personalising the State, an Anthropology of Law, Politics and Welfare in Austerity Britain, published by OUP in 2018. And it was the winner of the Social Legal Studies Association's Hart Prize for Early Career um, Academics. Her new project, and what she just tells me is the second contract from OUP, is on the British state's discovery of modern slavery, focused in particular on the question of so-called county lines drug dealing. So, um, enough from me. It's a great pleasure to have you here, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, can everyone hear me? Is that okay? Okay, great. Um, so I just want to start by thanking people. Thank you, Ian, for inviting me and um, for your introductions. Uh, thank you to, f uh, to the Centre for Criminology and also the Law Faculty for hosting me tonight. I also wanted to say thank you to my mentors. I've already seen Laura in the room, but um, s some of you here tonight were amongst the first ones to nurture me, I guess, when I was doing my doctorate here at Oxford a long time ago. And I'm grateful for, for everything you taught me back then and continue to teach me now. Um, I also want to thank my peers and my friends for coming out tonight um, and for making working in academia worthwhile. And finally, thank you to my friends from Blackbird Lees and from Oxford for welcoming me into your lives and communities a long time ago and for con uh, continuing to inspire me to do my research. Okay, so today's lecture is in memory and in celebration of Pro Professor Roger Hood. Um, obviously, Roger is remembered for many of his contributions to scholarship, but one of the things that made his work stand out, at least for me, was his commitment to putting criminology in the service of critiquing the state and state laws. He was not afraid to ask critical questions about the violence that is routinely committed by governments, often in the name of doing unmitigated good. And what I want to do in my lecture today is to take this spirit as my own point of departure to critically unpack a policy that has been very much celebrated by the British establishment. And by that I mean the media, politicians, government experts, but also civil society actors. And what I'm talking about today is um, the state's discovery and its policies relating to modern slavery and their application to the case of domestic drug trafficking cases, also known as county lines cases. Okay. So I want to begin my story today by taking you to the picture of this young man. This is Glody Wabelua, and he's 29 years of age. Glody came from Congo to London when he was five years old, together with his sister and his mother. <coughs> 
His father had already come to the UK a few years prior and he was working as a painter and decorator. And once he'd saved enough money for Glody and um, the remaining family, he sent for them to come and join him. Glody spent his childhood in South London in an area called Forest Hill on a housing estate where crime and unemployment were ripe. When he first came to the UK, he didn't speak a word of English and he found himself bullied at school. And what he learned from a young age is that he had to fight to defend himself. Glody remembers that there was never much money growing up in the house despite his dad's struggle um, to make ends meet. And as a young teenager, he was selling supermarket donuts in the schoolyard to make a bit of extra money. When he was 13, he started dealing cannabis on the streets. But relationships broke down at home when his mother found out what he was doing. And when he was um, 15 years old, he found himself sleeping rough on the streets. Through a friend, Glody was introduced to a slightly older guy, about 20, 21 years of age, who offered him a place to stay in return for Glody working for him. Now this was Glody's introduction into selling Class A drugs, heroin and crack cocaine. As a low-level runner, he'd be sent to places all over the country, carrying the drugs on him and selling them directly onto street users, often getting implicated in very violent uh, situations. In 2010, when he was 16 years old, Glody was caught with drugs on him by the police, and he was charged and convicted for three years in a young offenders institution. He came out of prison when he was 18 years old, and shortly after he'd come out of prison, he ran into the man that he used to work for. The guy told him that he was happy that Glody hadn't snitched on him and that he'd done his time. And they went out for food, and during a meal, the man told Glody that he still owed him money. And this is because when the police had arrested him, they had confiscated the drugs and the money that he was carrying, and it was that which he now owed the guy. The guy told Glody that he would help him pay off his debt and allow Glody to earn some money at the same time so they would strike a deal that would work both ways. He would now answer the phone or hold the line. And this was essentially a modest step up from being a worker or runner in the drugs line to becoming what we might want to call a shift manager. So now he would take phone calls from drug users and direct those orders to, to other runners um, rather than being the person who is out on the streets dealing drugs himself. Now, young men like Glody are not an isolated <coughs> case. They count amongst the thousands that the government has discovered as being involved in what, has, what, what it has come to call county lines. County lines is the name that the British government gave in 2015 to essentially the street-level economy of heroin and crack cocaine that is spreading from larger cities to smaller towns and coastal areas. And here you can see a map that obviously features London and some of the lines going out, but you can imagine something similar from other major cities across the country. Now, what the government has argued is that as drugs markets are becoming saturated in the big cities, places like London, drug dealers are spreading out into the counties or provinces, establishing drugs lines that work through the use of a designated mobile phone line. And what makes county lines quite so vicious as a form of crime, according to the government, is not only the fact that it sort of cuts across traditional police boundaries or local authority boundaries, but also the fact that it relies on distinct forms of exploitation. What we're told by the government is that those at the bottom rung of the drugs economy have actually been trafficked, enslaved and exploited by others who are higher up in the drugs chain. As a consequence, the government argues that the young people and also vulnerable adults who work at the bottom rung of this drugs economy should no longer be criminalized for drugs offenses and other offenses that they might have committed, but instead they should be treated as victims that are in need of state protection and care. Now, this discovery of county line dealers as victims, indeed as slaves, raises a number of key questions that lie at the heart of my talk today and that are also at the heart of the book, the bigger book project that I'm thinking about at the moment. And so here are some of the questions. How has the British state gone from criminalizing drug dealers to treating them as victims or in fact as slaves? What kinds of moral, legal and political realities are constructed in this process? <coughs> 
And what does any or all of this tell us about the state or statecraft making in Britain today? So what I want to do today is to deconstruct the idea that has very much been endorsed by the government, the media, but also academic scholarship, that the shift from criminalization to redemption has been an unqualified blessing. Not because I don't believe that young people like Lodi shouldn't be supported by the state, quite the opposite, but because I think what my research shows me is that the government's modern slavery agenda is ultimately giving rise to murky jurisprudence that ends up entrenching racial and social injustices that lie at the heart of austerity Britain. And what I want to argue by way of conclusion today is that I think we can use the case study I'm presenting here as a starting point for thinking about more general critical decolonial endeavors. And as I said, I'll come back to that point in some of my more analytical points in the conclusion. What I want to do for now, in order to break down some of these quite abstract points, is to just start by situating the debate. I'm then going to move on to some of the data or the ethnography I've done, and then I'm going to come to some conclusions. And I will try to stick to time, but Ian, you're very welcome to cut me off or remind me. Okay, I'm going to start by situating the debate then. So, in the summer of 2019, I found myself at a community event in South London. The keynote speaker for the evening was a white English man called Kevin Highland. You might have heard the name, a former police officer, but also the former independent anti-slavery commissioner, which itself is quite a new governmental office. And he opened the evening in the following words. He said, over 200 years ago, Britain made the slave trade illegal. And yet we have to accept the shame and the responsibility that this evil is still happening. 40 million people across the world are suffering from slavery, modern slavery, people in London and in Congo. 15 million people were involved in the transatlantic slave trade. In our time, that is just in one day. Now, these words were not unusual. The British government has discovered modern slavery as the number one threat facing the British nation. And the flagship of the government's modern slavery agenda is enshrined in the Modern Slavery Act, which you can see here on the left. Uh, essentially an unprecedented piece of, of legislation that for purposes of my analysis today makes two key provisions. So on the one hand, it provides a prosecution tool for those who are accused of modern slavery offenses, the maximum punishment for which is the state's most punitive sanction, so life imprisonment. On the other hand, this piece of legislation provides a defense for people who've committed certain offenses, including drugs offenses, um, while they were in a state of slavery or exploitation. So young runners like Glody, for example, who were made to sell Class A drugs on the streets, now potentially have a route to acquittal if they run this exploitation defense. On the back of this piece of legislation, a whole institutional and funding landscape has been emerging as frontline workers, legal experts, government bodies, as well as civil society actors are learning to speak, identify, and respond to what they consider to be these problems of modern slavery. Now, just to give a bit more context, when Parliament in enacted the Modern Slavery Act, it didn't actually have the demographic of county line dealers in mind. On the contrary, debates in Parliament were at the time still very much focused on cross-border trafficking issues. So concerns were over um, migrants, particularly from the global south, who were seen as being trafficked by so-called organized criminal networks for purposes of sex and labor exploitation across national borders. And what was felt by Parliament at the time is that better protection and law enforcement mechanisms were needed to respond to these problems. And I should also just say in passing here that this very much reflected broader concerns in the international arena that had been running strong since at least the late 1980s and that had already fed into a number of international conventions and protocols, including the UN Protocol Against Trafficking. Sometimes you see that referred to as the Palermo Protocol. Some of you might have come across it. But what interests me today is what happens on the domestic scene. And what is interesting is that since the implementation of the, the Modern Slavery Act, what we see is that this piece of legislation has become more and more domesticated um, or vernacularized, as we might want to say. And what I mean by that is that government statistics today tell us that we've seen an exponential growth in modern slaves 
who have been trafficked and enslaved on home grounds, so within national borders. And this growth in slaves has been in large part attributed to the growth of county lines. So that's the connection here. Now, what makes the discovery of county line dealers as a case of slavery so astonishing, at least for me, is that the people we're talking about here actually count among some of the most stigmatized and criminalized demographics of young people in this country. As I'm sure people in this room are aware of, the British government has been waging a war on gangs, right? You've heard of this, <laughs> I'm sure. The impetus for this, or the most recent impetus for this, were the so-called riots in 2011, the largest civil uprisings that England had seen in a few decades, that followed the police's killing of a young black man called Mark Duggan. What happened in the aftermath of these civil uprisings is that the government came to argue that a pathological gang culture was to blame for the violence that had erupted during these uprisings, but also for all sorts of other moral and social ills that the British nation was facing. And the upshoot of that was that many young people, particularly from disenfranchised, urban, minoritized, working-class communities, now saw themselves labeled as gang members, and their names were entered on police databases. This, in turn, as people like Patrick Williams, but also organizations like Amnesty International have shown us, um, justified an ever closer monitoring, surveillance, and criminalization of young people's intimate lives, their everyday social movements, but also their involvement in artistic expressions such as drill music. Now what's interesting to me is that the same government that has implemented the war on gangs is now also the government that has discovered potentially the same demographic of young people as potential victims in need of saving. In fact, it was intelligence supplied by local police forces and authorities to the government's gang unit, so it's ending youth and gang violence program, that was central to the government's subsequent discovery of county lines in 2015. So there was a direct institutional link here. Now this discovery of the demographic of so-called gangsters as potential victims, in fact as slaves, appears like a good news story. One whereby those whose suffering had previously gone unheard, in fact actively been criminalized, is now explicitly recognized by the state. From this point of view, I think the government's modern slavery agenda is not only a much overdue policy, but also promises greater social and racial inclusion, which I think is one of the reasons why the left has also been in favor of this policy, which has been implemented by a conservative government. And yet, I think as Bridget Anderson, drawing on Wendy Brown, reminds us, and this is a quote, a sure sign of a depoliticizing trope or discourse is the easy and politically cross-cutting embrace of a political project bearing its name. In fact, as scholars from within anthropology, which is the discipline or one of the disciplines that I was trained in, um, have shown, we need to critically interrogate what they call the humanitarian impulse or the bourgeois humanism that is implied by these linear tales from punishment to redemption. What anthropologists have shown us is that the politics of victimhood has typically justified all manners of external interference on the part of Western liberal nations in the name of saving colonial as well as post-colonial subjects for their own good. Modern slavery policies, we can say, are an example of this par excellence. Anti-trafficking scholars working mostly in the realm of kind of cross-border trafficking debates, so in the international realm, have shown us that these policies have not only perpetuated what Julia O'Connor Davidson has called a liberal superhero tale about the West, but they've also tended to justify ever more draconian border immigration and criminal justice policies. So what I want to do today and what I'm trying to do in the book that I'm writing is to take these critical perspectives as my own point of departure to investigate the question of what happens when so-called criminals are rethought as slaves on home ground. In fact, I think when it comes to Britain and Britain's domestic policies, we have much reason to be cautious. And this is because modern slavery policies don't operate in a level playing field. These policies are being rolled out against the backdrop of a decade of austerity politics on top of much longer decades of neoliberal decline and privatization. 
against the backdrop of a growing gap between poor and rich that has resulted in what Danny Dorling here at Oxford has called peak inequality. And finally, against the backdrop of a deeply biased and broken criminal justice system that continues to disproportionately target the same people who are now discovered as slaves. Now, what I'm trying to do in the book that I'm writing is to work through the sort of series of disjunctures here, but I don't really have the time today. So what I, just, what I want to do for purposes of tonight is just focus on this aspect here, namely on how the modern slavery policies um, ultimately exist alongside, entrench, and further legitimize, as I'm going to try to show, racial and social injustices that lie at the heart of the law and the criminal justice system. So just very quickly, what have I actually been doing? What gives me authority <laughs> to talk about any of this? Um, I've been doing multi-sided fieldwork, or ethnography as an anthropologist and as a lawyer, to understand the sort of emerging landscape of modern slavery jurisprudence. And that has involved three key elements. I've, first of all, I've done a sort of multi-sided, multi-institutional analysis, working with law enforcement, so police officers, all sorts of other frontline workers, government experts and lawyers, prosecution and defense lawyers, um, as well as judges on how they see and come to act on this new reality of slavery that they're now being instructed to recognize. Second, I've also been doing activist and advocacy driven fieldwork with families and communities at the grassroots level. And this project I just want to mention here um, started much earlier, actually back in 2008, when I was first a doctoral student, I guess, and I went to live on a working class, multi-ethnic working class community um, on an urban council estate to do fieldwork on how the people who live in that community experience the state on a day-to-day -day basis. At the time, I spent a number of years living in the community, participating in people's day-to-day -day lives, also using my legal skills to become an advocate in many situations. Um, and that's the book that Ian mentioned earlier that sort of came out of it. And what I've seen is that over the years as I've gone back to the community is that many of the young people, um, as they kind of grew up and came, came of age, became involved in what the government now calls county lines. And it's mostly the mothers and the family members who I've over the years formed close relationship with, uh, who I've come to work with and try and support as they're now encountering this new regime of modern slavery and county lines and policy terms. And then finally, in addition to working with the families as well as with various kind of um, professionals and faces of the state, I've also been doing um, an ethnography of the courts, of the Crown Courts, so Britain's most serious criminal courts, where for the first time in history, uh, modern slavery trials are being brought. So I've spent hundreds of hours over the past few years just trying to, to observe and understand what's happening in these proceedings. So what then are some of my findings? Okay, I'm going to come now to the first of my kind of substantive ethnographic sections, which I call here the making of slaves, which looks at how slaves are imagined into existence at the front line. Is my pace okay? Okay, so I first came across the policy term county lines in the summer of 2018 when I spent three months in a city about an hour's drive from London. And during this trip, I heard a number of frontline professionals, law enforcement, social workers, housing officials, local authority workers, talk about what they saw as a new crisis of drugs, crime and violence facing their city. And one of the people who spoke to me about this new crisis was a woman called Claire, who's a police officer and a white English woman in her 30s. And this is what she said to me. She said, this is a long quote, county lines are probably the biggest threat. The drug dealers are coming in. When it used to be in an area, the homegrown drugs market, so in her, in her, um, within her own um, home city, you could deal with it by taking down your drug dealers and then getting interventions for the drug users. But now you take one out and another comes straight in from London and it isn't in-house anymore. They're traveling all over and it's just becoming massive. And with that, all the violence is just spiraling out of control. 
Now, it bears stating up front, I think, that not everyone would agree with this narrative of exceptionalism that sees county lines as something unprecedented and totally new. Some critical voices, including at the front line, have made themselves heard in recent years. What some of them at least have shown us is that I think this narrative of exceptionalism is not a neutral description, but also heavily mediated through a racialized and classed imaginary that sees urban working class men as flooding Britain's provinces, which in turn are imagined as white, innocent and middle class. And I think you can see a visualization of this contrast between the sort of innocent provinces and the evil cities in these government posters. Um, on the right, you have a poster produced by the government that represents the urban gangsters coming to the provinces from London. And on the left, you have the, the people who are victimized by the people coming in. And I just, I mean, think that the sort of racialized, gendered implications of these visualizations are very stark. I, I don't think I need to say any more. But if these dominant narratives of provinces under threat by incoming urban drug dealers can in some ways at least be seen as an extension then of the government's gang narrative that I referred to earlier, then I think it's important to understand that this is not the whole story. So Claire, the police officer I mentioned earlier, continued to explain to me in an interview that we did that those involved in county lines can also be vulnerable themselves. In other words, the people here on the right, the so-called gangsters, can also be victims. And she gave me an example of what that, she gave me many examples of what this meant, but I just want to mention one example that is very close to home that some of you in this room um, might have heard of or even worked on. So here you see the picture of a 16-year-old boy from Birmingham called Haram Jama, who was stabbed to death in Oxford in January 2018, about an hour's drive away from his home city. Now, this boy, he'd been out dealing drugs that day. He'd been selling drugs to some of the homeless drugs users in the city centre. And his attackers, to my knowledge, were never um, brought to trial. Now, on one level... Haram Jama personified the narrative of crime, drugs, and death coming to the provinces from the biggest cities. As a stranger to Oxford with an African-sounding name and his dark skin, we can say that he personified the ultimate outsider. And yet, Claire, the police officer, also insisted to me that he was strongly suspected to be a victim. Indeed, what she said to me is that at the time of his death, he'd actually been entered into the government's mechanism for recording modern slaves. It's called the NRM, the National Referral Mechanism, a bureaucratic body that's ho housed by the Home Office and that certain um, authorized uh, professions and authorities can make submissions to. Okay? And, and then that body determines if a person is indeed a victim of human trafficking and slavery or not. So while this young man, this boy, was still awaiting his decision at the time of his death, Claire said that she was confident he would have been found to have been a slave because he ticked all the right boxes of being exploited. That's what she said. She said he was young, gullible, and easily groomed. He'd most likely been drawn into drug dealing under the pretense of false promises, and he'd been forced to travel outside of his hometown. Now, Claire's depiction or description of what made this young man a victim, indeed a slave, was not unusual. As I came to do more research with law enforcement and other frontline professionals, I began to understand what exactly it was that made young people like him vulnerable and victims in the eyes of the state. It was the fact that they were said to have suffered from the evil and manipulative actions of others who were operating from within. So here's, for example, what Natasha, another white English law enforcement officer, said during a modern slavery training session that she delivered to a group of police officers in 2019. And I was able to go along to this training session. She said, of the 400 people so that, so that I've supported over the years, so she's somebody who works with victims, one case stands out to me, Jack. He was 12 years old. Do you all know what plugging is? Yes? Where drugs are put up somebody's bottom or where it's a girl up her vagina. Jack had three kinder eggs with class A drugs up his bum. The worst is that an adult made him do it. And then Jack gets set up to be robbed of his drugs. He goes to his next lieutenant, so the person high up in the chain, who told him that Jack now owes him money. 
Jack is made to commit knife crimes on the streets as a way to recover the money. Now, the government has a term for this sort of suffering from within that is so graphically depicted here. Criminal exploitation, or where the victim is a child, child criminal exploitation. And in 2018, the Home Office recognized criminal exploitation as one form of modern slavery. You can see this on this government poster. Um, In turn engendering new policing responses or new ways of seeing like, a, uh, seeing like a state, as Scott would put it. In the words of one law enforcement official I spoke to, recognizing those who'd been criminally exploited as slaves challenged the police to move away from its traditional approach of what this officer called catch and convict attitude to foreground questions of empathy and care. Now, police officers told me what it meant to treat victims as vict- uh, to treat drug dealers as, vi- as victims deserving of empathy and care. It meant that charges for drug dealing could be dropped, or even where they weren't dropped, that when it comes to trial, these young defendants had had an opportunity to run the exploitation defence that I was referring to earlier. It also meant that welfare support could be extended to them. And sometimes it meant that not just these young people, but entire families were protected, such as when they were moved outside of the areas of where the grooming had allegedly happened and were offered homes in in different constituencies. And yet, I think these types of interventions should not be romanticized either. So again, in my long-term field site, an urban council estate and about an hour's drive away from London, I witnessed one family get moved by the authorities. So in this particular instance, the son of that family, a white British 15-year-old boy who had recently been discovered by the NRM to be a slave, um, that that whole family was moved to to a new home outside of their local constituency. And as, as I've tried to show elsewhere, the relocation of that family not only violently removed the family from their local networks, including those but not limited to the illicit economy, but ultimately this well-intended move actually did nothing to address the material circumstances that had pushed that young person into the illicit economy in the first place, including a decade or nearly a decade then of austerity politics and its uneven effects on working class communities. But I think if sort of failures to address the underlying structural or material causes that often are the reason why young people end up in the illicit economy is one of the problems with this agenda, then there is another problem with the government's narrative of saving the vulnerable, and that's what I want to focus on now. As I want to show now, it also, I think, remains oblivious to the workings of a deeply racist and classist criminal justice system that silences any grassroots attempts to make alternative stories heard. So what do I mean by that? And what do the stories of the mothers and other family members of these young men show us, and the boys? Okay, I want to explain this point now by coming to my next ethnographic section, which I call ethnographic disjunctures. So if from the point of view of law enforcement and the government, the modern slavery agenda constituted a genuine opportunity for more inclusive change, then I think the situation could look very different from the perspective of people at the receiving end. Now a large part of my research has been with the mothers and other female members, so typically sisters, aunts or even girlfriends of these young men um, who are now potentially discovered as slaves. And part of the reason why I've worked with the mothers so much is because they were often more easily accessible to me, they were more relatable to me, um, and I've been able to form close relationships and friendships as well as advocacy-type relationships with them over the years. So to understand how these mothers and other female carers experience the situation, let me turn again to an example. So here you see uh, the picture of a woman called Angelique, Mm. I met her in 2018, and she's the mother of a 25-year-old black man from South London um, who I call Tyrese. It's not his real name. Tyrese was serving a prolonged sentence for drugs and also some other offenses when I first met her a few years ago, and he's recently been recalled to prison, so he's back in prison now. 
Now, Tyrese had never been recognized by the system as an official slave. Part of it might be down to timing. So he was first arrested around 2015-16 when the government's modern slavery agenda was only just beginning to be rolled out. As I said, county lines was only discovered in 2015. But even in subsequent years, um, the authorities failed to enter him into the NRM. And this was despite the fact that according to Angelique, this young man, her son, had displayed all the classical signs, as she said. So here you have a list of official indicators of exploitation, a list that had been produced by one of the local authorities in London, and Angelique sent it to me in an email. And what she'd done, the details don't concern us here today, but what she'd done is she put a tick behind all of the indicators that her son had displayed, thus making the case that on the government's own logic, he should have been recognized as a victim and he should have been protected rather than criminalized. Now, Angelique's story was not unique. Throughout my research, I came across countless cases where individuals had never been officially recognized as slaves by the state, alternatively, where they might have been recognized as slaves by the NRM mechanism, and yet it made no meaningful difference to how their cases were handled. In many of these cases, family members had been campaigning for years. So Angelique, for example, had trained herself in grassroots advocacy, learning about words such as exploitation, trafficking, modern slavery, and instrumentalizing them to remind the authorities of what she considered to be their duty of care towards her son. And yet, attempts to actualize their children's rights to make their stories heard often had very murky, if not outright contradictory, effects. Women like Angelique would typically find that they were labeled difficult or angry parents in their interactions with frontline officials. Thus also, we might want to say, tapping into deeper racialized and gendered narratives that have tended to stigmatize minority ethnic working class women. More so, these labels of these women being difficult or angry could then be used to exclude them from any kind of professional interaction or from professional settings that their children had to go through, including from um, public court processes or trials that these children had to go through. So let me just turn to an example to illustrate the point. In one instance, both I and 35-year-old Tanisha, a black woman from South London and a trained social worker, found ourselves banned from the public gallery by the court. We had been attending Rico's murder trial in the spring of 2019, and Rico was Tanisha's brother. Rico was, at the time, a 16-year-old boy who'd been charged under the doctrine of joint enterprise, which I'm sure people in this room are familiar with, for the murder of a drug user alongside his co-defendant, who was also his boss in a county line, a, an older white male. Now, Tanisha had come to the trial of her brother to give Rico support as a family member, as his sister, but also actually as his appointed guardian. And for her, this meant that, or for her, the way she perceived of her role was that she had a duty to exercise what she called vigilant care in a trial that she felt had been stuck up against her brother from the get-go. So using her training and her knowledge as a social worker, she did her best to mitigate the prosecution's portrayal of Rico as a ruthless gang member who'd been willfully involved in county lines. She tried to get the court to see that this portrayal had been based on a wrongly quoted report by social services. So there was actually no evidential basis for this. She tried to get across the point that, in fact, Rico had received a decision by the NRM that had confirmed that he was an exploited victim and that furthermore he desperately needed psychological assessments to be carried out in light of the history of traumas and undiagnosed disabilities. Yet her attempts to advocate for her brother in these various ways had not only generated resentment among Rico's own legal team but also raised the prosecution's suspicion. This somehow, I don't know how, got fed back to the judge who one day and without warning ruled that Tanisha had disrupted the legal proceedings and that she, as well as all family members and associates, including myself, would be banned from entering the courtroom under the threat of arrest. Now, this was not the end of Tanisha's advocacy work, however. So a couple of days after she'd been banned from going to court, and I also stopped going at that point, 
Rico was found guilty of manslaughter by the, by the jury. The judge sentenced him to an aggravated life sentence, ruling that his involvement as a low-level runner in county lines was not a mitigating but an aggravating factor because it made him a particularly dangerous individual. What happened to Rico is that he was moved to Cook and Wood Young Offenders Institution, a notorious prison um, that has been in the spotlight for its high levels of staff and inmate violence. And uh, these are just a couple of, of, of reports that have picked up on this. The, the picture on the left is a um, screenshot of a BBC article for only from last month. And then on the right you see um, the most recent report of an unannounced inspection back in 2021 of this young offenders institution. Tanisha caught me in tears one day. Rico had been attacked by a prison guard, a white officer, in what Tanisha felt or worried might have been a racially motivated attack. She never got proof of that. Rico told her over the phone what had happened. A prison guard had approached him and asked him to beat up some of the other boys on the wing. When Rico refused, the guard had acted out revenge on him. One day, he'd left Rico's cell door open and a group of boys had come in and brutally attacked Rico while he was lying on a bed. Um, it was only after some time that officers came to intervene. Instead of breaking up the boys, one of the officers proceeded to attack Rico, dragging him um, to the floor and holding him in a chokehold, leaving dark bruises around his neck that would be visible for weeks. Now, at that point, Tanisha and I tried to, to spring into action. We made a series of complaints, including to the prison, uh, prison governor, demanding to see CCTV evidence, which was repeatedly denied to us. Worse, what Tanisha now found is that she was labelled an angry family member, so there you have that language again, and she found that she was now excluded from attending any meetings concerning her brother, even though she was his appointed guardian, thus losing any means of getting information about his well-being in prison. But perhaps worst of all, we would later find out that Rico had been what seemed to us informally punished for our attempts to intervene. He had his so-called privileges withdrawn, was kept in solitary confinement for days at a time, and was routinely tantalized by prison staff. In the end, it was only after months, and also with the repeated pressures on the part of a pro bono prison lawyer that we'd managed to get hold of, that the prison reacted, <laughs> not by opening an investigation, but rather by silently moving Rico into a different prison in the early hours of the morning. Now, you might say that the stories I've presented here by Angelique or Tanisha are idiosyncratic or extreme, but I think they fit into what we know about the entrenched racism and classist biases that are at the heart of a deeply broken, and we should also really emphasize, chronically underfunded criminal justice system. And these are just three of you know, many reports that have come out over the past few years that in one way or another have made these points. Here that I think it is in, in the voices and stories of family members like the mothers I've presented here that a very different view of suffering shifts into focus. Not the individualized or interpersonal suffering that the government's story of county lines and child criminal exploitation has emphasized, but rather the structural violence that families have to confront and the intimate effects that this structural violence has on their children's day-to-day -day lives. So here, for example, is what Angelique said about her son. She said, it's not only the exploitation and modern slavery of drugs that affects young people, but young people like her son are also exploited and enslaved by the criminal justice system now. My son has picked up a certain mentality just from being through the system. He believes himself to be an offender. The system is just as guilty as the people who exploit him. It's a kind of systemic abuse. So how then, to come back to the topic of my talk today, how do modern slavery policies operate in this context of what she calls systemic abuse? How is it that some young people get discovered as slaves and others become identified by the legal system as perpetrators? And what actually happens to those who are said to stand behind the crimes of modern slavery? Asking these questions takes me to my last bit of ethnography. Yeah? Okay. Um, which is the ethnography I've been doing of Crown Courts, where I've been trying to follow some of these modern slavery trials as they're being rolled out really for the first time in Britain today. 
So I come here now to my last substantive section and then I'm going to come to some conclusions. Okay, I want to start again with an example. Here you have a picture of a rubber. You see him here on the left. He's a criminal defense barrister um, working for one of the major um, criminal law chambers in London. And I met Rubber in the spring of 2020, so quite recently, actually. Rubber is the child of Moroccan parents. He'd grown up on a North London housing estate, and he had a lot of empathy with his clients, who he said um, were very um, close to the life that he'd had um, as he was growing up in North London. When I met him in 2020, he was going through what he described to me as the most shambolic trial. They were his words. His client was a young man called Ribbon, an 18-year-old black man who'd come from Jamaica as a young child. Now, Ribbon had been 16 years old at the time of offending, and his story is very similar to the other stories I've presented to you today. So he'd been caught with drugs on him in Portsmouth um, about an hour, an hour and a half, I think, um, um, an hour's train ride away from his home city, London. Now... The trial had already started, and while the trial had already started, he was entered into the NRM mechanism, or he'd already been entered into the NRM mechanism, but the decision came back that he had, in fact, been an exploited slave, that he was a victim of human trafficking. Notwithstanding this finding, the prosecution announced that they were going to, uh, to continue with the trial so that the drugs charges would not be dropped. Now, Rubber, the defense barrister you see here, he was outraged. For him, charging a client um, with these offences when he'd already been found by one wing of the government to have been an exploited slave would amount to a fundamental act of injustice. Not because it was legally not possible. It is, you know, and I can explain that later if you want. You can legally charge somebody who's been found to have been a slave with offences. But his argument was that it went directly against the broader spirit of the modern slavery legislation, or the policies which sought precisely to protect the vulnerable. So what he wanted to argue in front of the judge was that proceedings should be staged. And failing that, he said he wanted to run the modern slavery defense or the exploitation defense to argue in front of the jury that his client should be acquitted. So I spent a week in Portsmouth Crown Court. You see a picture of that here on the, on the right. And during that week, I watched a schizophrenic tr a judicial dispute unfold in front of the judge as the legal party struggled to establish what constituted the threshold of when a person went from being a victim to becoming a perpetrator. And what struck me was that the very same facts that on one account, the defense's account, were seen as evidence of this being a victim of exploitation, were seen on another account, namely the prosecution, as evidence of this person's cunning criminal behavior. So, for example, the fact that Ribbon had repeatedly gone back to drug dealing even after you know, the police had safeguarded him, uh, that he did not want to be seen to be cooperating with the police, and in fact that he refused to see himself as a slave or a victim, were seen by the defense as um, evidence of the fact that he was a victim who'd been groomed, whereas the prosecution argued it was evidence of his cunning, manipulative behavior. Now, a week after the legal disputes, the judge gave his ruling. He sided in favor of the prosecution, arguing that he was entirely satisfied that the young man had gone from being a victim to becoming what he called an alpha victim, someone who's mastered the game of victimhood. Now, I think the case had revealed a fundamental epistemological uncertainty that I've come across again and again. This is one of many trials, um, namely that of distinguishing slaves from perpetrators in a situation where exploitation is defined as a problem that is emanating from within. As a senior detective in the London Met Police said to me, at what point does a victim become a suspect? It's a sliding scale. <laughs> and, and actually nothing is fixed on that sliding scale. Because you find yourself going from being a victim to being an offender, almost back to victim. It just depends on the dynamics of the situation. Now, I think this quote and the case had revealed a central problem. Just how easy it is for a drug dealer like Ribbon to go from being seen a victim or a slave to becoming a perpetrator once more. But if victims can become drug dealers, then I think the picture gets even murkier 
When we turn to a final question, the question of who then gets prosecuted for modern slavery or human trafficking offences under the Modern Slavery Act. So let's just quickly remember the Modern Slavery Act, I said this at the beginning, it doesn't just make a defence available, the exploitation defence, but it also provides a prosecution tool for people who are said to stand behind these crimes of human trafficking. And what we've now seen is the first successful prosecutions and convictions being secured. And these are all mugshots I got from, from the media. I have not been able to access a, um, a complete database of these prosecutions um, for reasons I can explain later. Um, but what I want to do is just conclude with this case here, which, according to some sources at least, was the first ever successful conviction for human trafficking in a county lines trial that was secured by a jury-led trial. Now, this case was described to me as a saga by the officer in case, or the officer who'd overseen the entire investigation, because the case had actually started back in 2014. I met him in 2019, so the case had been going on for five years. To cut a long and also very convoluted story short, so I'm going to try and simplify it here, what happened here is that the three young men you see on the picture had been charged and convicted of drugs offences in 2015 alongside, I think, 10 other defendants. So it was a massive um, drugs conspiracy trial. These three young men had been found dealing drugs um, on, uh, a drugs line going from, uh, on a number of drugs lines going from London to Portsmouth. And yet their conviction for drugs conspiracy was not the end of the story. While they were serving their prison sentences for drugs, the officer who'd overseen the investigation and his team came to think that the defendants had actually done much worse, that they weren't simply drug dealers who had willfully engaged in criminal activity, but actually that they had instrumentalized and used others in the pursuit of this game. And this, I should say, was the year of 2015-16, so the language of county lines and exploitation was just beginning to take hold. The officer in case told me that him and his legal team chanced upon human trafficking legislation almost by accident, he said. But it would take until 2017, another two years, before they were given permission by the Crown Prosecution Service to charge. And even then, the case went to retrial several times. It was a really messy, messy trial. In 2019... I went to trial in inner London Crown Court, having this time been invited by the prosecution and the police to join this trial. Their case was that the three young men had trafficked children and one vulnerable adult from London to Portsmouth with a view of exploiting them while they themselves had stayed in the safety of their homes holding the drugs line. At the close of the prosecution's case, two of the defendants stepped forward and pleaded guilty. And they'd been told by the judge, or they'd been given an indication that they would be able to reduce their sentences if they pleaded guilty at that stage. Now, the remaining defendant pressed on. And this was Glody, the young man with whom I started my talk today. Now, Glody tried his best to make a different story heard, one that at the very least showed a more nuanced understanding, one where he, aged 20 at the time, had only been a couple of years older than the person he was said to have trafficked. That also, he'd only been dealing drugs because he too had a debt to pay back. Remember, I said that, that he had a drug debt to pay back when he came out of prison. And that hence, he himself was only one step removed from the person he was said to have enslaved and exploited, holding the phone line rather than being the person who was out on the streets. To no avail. In June 2019, Glody was convicted by the jury um, as a human trafficker in a county lines case. And while his conviction was celebrated by the press, both the liberal press and the more conservative newspapers, as a landslide victory, as a precedent-setting case of the fight against evil, I think it had also revealed a deep irony, namely that Britain's first ever slave masters in a county line case were three young minority ethnic men who didn't look all that different from those they were said to have enslaved. Okay, I'm going to come to some conclusions now. I'm going to try and bring some of what I've presented to you today together now. And what I want to do is to conclude by coming back to a question that I posed at the outset of my, my talk today. 
And that was the question of what the case study that I've presented to you today tells us about the making or perhaps remaking of the state and statecraft in contemporary Britain. Now, a dominant narrative has crystallized amongst criminologists, scholars of punishment, and other social scientists about the punitive turn that Britain, alongside other liberal democracies, has taken. According to this narrative, a once liberal state has taken an unduly illiberal turn as governments have come to institute a culture of control that governs through crime by punishing the poor. These are obviously very well-known quotes that most of you would have heard of in the works I'm sure you've read. Now, on the face of it, I think, we can say that the government's modern slavery agenda constitutes a departure from this punitive turn, a promise, as I said at the beginning, for greater social and racial inclusion. And yet, I think the data that I've collected, the ethnographic work that I've done, shows that these policies have not been an unqualified blessing, to say it mildly. I think, on the contrary, attempts to protect or safeguard young people, and those I just want to emphasize are genuine attempts. I'm not attributing any malicious intentions to anybody here. But these attempts to protect and safeguard young people are set off, I think, by the workings of a broken and deeply biased criminal justice system in which the very language of slavery is not only used very selectively, but where the language acts as a gateway for further criminalization and control. I think, judged from this perspective, the analysis I've provided here provides an important empirical corrective to the claim that what we're seeing through the government's modern slavery agenda is a departure from its more traditional punitive workings. On the contrary, I think what we're seeing here is a further entrenchment of the state's own logics of punitive control that are now taking place in the realm of vulnerability and victimhood itself. But I think my contributions are not just empirical. I think, on the contrary, they also pose certain analytical challenges. So let me just explain this point. Now, criminologists, and some of them, you know, some of you are present here tonight, have repeatedly reminded us that crime is never a neutral phenomenon. It's not an ontological reality that's just out there, right? On the contrary, who or what counts as a victim and who or what counts as a perpetrator are deeply political questions that have typically been wrapped up with dominant ideas of national identity and belonging. As Paul Gilroy, for example, has argued, law is central to the production of an imperial imaginary that has typically painted questions of national belonging as middle class and white at the exclusion of classed and racialized others. From the mugging panic of the 1970s that was analyzed by Stuart Hall right, and his colleagues at Birmingham to the figure of the political right that Paul Gilroy himself analyzed in the book I'm thinking of, right through to the figure of the gang member, I'm thinking again of Patrick Williams' work, to the figure of the terrorist you know, in the 2000s. Minority, ethnic, and working class urban youth have repeatedly served as a counterpoint to the sort of imagined British nation. Now, I would argue against this backdrop that what we're seeing in Britain today is actually an escalation of these images of black criminality, no longer just in the figure of the mugger, the rioter, or the gang member, but actually in the figure of the very antithesis of liberal freedom, the modern day slave master. And this escalation, I think, of images of black criminality might not be an accident. For what interests me, or what I find astonishing, is that the moral register of slavery has been appropriated by the British state at precisely the same moment when Britain's national unity, the very idea of what counts as Britishness, has come under attack. So the modern slavery agenda was rolled out at the same time as movements such as Black Lives Matter took the streets of Britain, took the streets of Oxford, drawing attention to a very different reading of slavery, of the British state's failure to confront its own unacknowledged histories of racial empire and transatlantic slavery, and their continuing afterlives in Britain today. In fact, movement members and critical scholars will tell us that the kinds of social and racial injustices that I have presented on today count precisely amongst the afterlives of racial empire in Britain today.
I think against this backdrop, then, the state's modern slavery agenda appears like um, appears <coughs> sorry like a project, a violent project of what we might want to call political resignification. It's a project that has allowed the British state to emerge once more as an emblem of civilization and care at a time of acute national crisis. Now, reconceived in this slide, I think, the account I've presented here can act as a critical starting point for more analytical endeavors. Endeavors that we conceive of crime, as I've said, not just as a problem of security, not just as a problem of law and order, although, of course, it's all of that too, but as an object of political rule that is deeply bound up with the crisis of the nation. It is precisely such an approach that I think, or that I would argue, should be central to decolonial endeavors but that has been missing from recent southern critical or post-colonial criminology that has often loosely been grouped together under the label of decolonial scholarship. As Cicchini and Greener, for example, have recently argued, this literature has tended to prioritize questions of epistemology and knowledge production, important as these questions are, over an analysis of more tangible structures of oppression, including an analysis of the state and political economy. And yet, I think if I'm making here a case um, for recentering the study of the state in this literature or in this sort of um, in this intellectual spirit, then I think this can't be the whole story. For we also need to foreground uh, sites of struggle and resistance. And I think beyond the sort of movements of radical protest that we've seen in movements such as Black Lives Matter, it is precisely through the stories of family members like the mothers that I've tried to present on here today um, that we can see important counter stories emerge, stories that refuse to be framed within the dominant cultural canon of othering. In doing so, these mothers, sisters, carers, and other family members not only continue to fight for their children's rights to be actualized, but they also sometimes explicitly position themselves in a longer line of anti-colonial and anti-state struggles. And I just wanted to leave you here with, again, coming back to Angelique, with a picture of what she's done. She's formed her own community enterprise, for example, training other parents, but also frontline workers in nonviolent resistance, an approach that is directly taken from the tradition of civil rights movements. And yet, we have a long way to go. I just want to conclude or finish by coming back to Glody. So Glody was released from prison in May last year. You can see him here. And his transition back to society has not been easy. His release has come with stringent conditions set by probation, some of which have actually included provisions that had previously been struck down by the Court of Appeal for being too draconian. So they found their way into the contract he now has with probation, which we can discuss later. He's not allowed to be homeless, but nobody helped him find a home. He also has to find a job but he's severely restricted in terms of the work he's actually allowed to do, and including being banned from working with young people or children, something he'd very much like to do. He also finds that his daily life is monitored down to every intimate relation or travel plan that he might have, and yet he doesn't give up. Glodia is in the process of setting up his own business, helping young men deal with mental health issues through physical exercise and by promoting well-being. He's also been active on social media and been approached by journalists, including um, recently featuring in a story in the New York Times. Not to make excuses for his behavior, but rather to give a more nuanced understanding, I think one that at the very least proves the futility of the slave and slave master distinction that has been so morally and legally absolute in the British state's current agenda. So I think I'm going to stop on this note, but I wanted to leave you with this slide. If you're interested to hear Glody talk about his own story, this is an interview he's given on social media recently. And then on the right, you have a screenshot of the story that was published in the New York Times. Thank you.
Um, we, we, we had a, a short period, about 20 minutes, to initiate a conversation which we can then carry on over a drink outside um, in response to that fascinating and stimulating um, talk. Um, the Q&A, just to let you know, the, the, plan, the, the lecture has been recorded. We'd also like, ideally, to record the Q&A. So if anyone asks a question, they would then like to be removed from the recording. Can they let me know at the end that we can edit it out? So the floor. Um, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. And um, I think I mentioned this in passing, but I want to be... Re Sorry, did you want me to answer or yeah, are you no, taking that's, collection that's questions? Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start again. Thank you, Suki, for your question. Um, I think you're absolutely right. It has been a means of revalidating the authority and, or legitimacy, I think, as I think you said. One thing I think I really wanted to make clear, and I've only mentioned in passing, is that I really don't attribute malicious intentions to those who are now tasked with the impossible role of identifying and responding right, to vulnerability and slavery. And many of these professionals and frontline officers are acutely aware of the kinds of dilemmas <coughs> that I've presented on, and they see it as an opportunity, as you say, to, to kind of redeem, I think, <laughs> some of the institutional failings that have characterized the system so much. I think the question, whenever we talk about revalidating legitimacy, is the question of in whose eyes and with what effects, right? I mean, it's just simply not good enough if state officials can revalidate their legitimacy to themselves. The question is, what does it do to the broader democratic Quality and, and also especially to those who are now allegedly saved by the system. And I think this is where a very different story emerges that ultimately always betrays the failures of the state to revalidate their legitimacy. I think it's failing as a project of legitimacy. It cannot but fail. But that's only if you want the state to be legitimate in the eyes of people. Yeah, that's also a very good point. Point taken, yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you very much. I thought it was uh, very powerful, uh, some of the images you used. And uh, I think I probably agree with many of your conclusions, but I was wondering how much, what, how much some, some of your conclusions are a product of it being a London-based piece of research. Yeah. Uh, I know of uh, colleagues that have done research on county lines in Liverpool, and it certainly has a different colour to it in Liverpool, uh, also county lines research going on in Glasgow, which is quite different. So I'm not discounting your conclusions, but how does that fit in with the, the wider picture of uh, yeah. research on county lines? Yeah. Um, thank you for your question. Okay. Um, how does the fact that there's also white kids involved in county lines fit with my narrative or arguments about the racialized implications? Am I paraphrasing this correctly? Uh, uh, you might be paraphrasing, but that's good enough. Yeah? Okay. No, I just wanted to make sure I understood your question correctly. <laughs> I would say two things about that. One is that the government has persistently failed to make any statistics available on the racial and ethnic breakdown of those involved in county lines. And this has not been down to ignorance or anything like that because there have been repeated attempts on the part of journalists, of advocacy organizations and researchers, including myself, to make that data available. So it's extremely difficult to get that data and 
Without that data, um, we are reliant on the kind of research that the colleagues you've just mentioned have done, the research that I'm doing, to tease out any kinds of arguments. Um, so that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is that I think I, this is not to invalidate your point that there are other kinds of kids <laughs> involved in county lines. Um, but my points about the political workings of this policy still stand. The fact that there are other kids involved in this doesn't invalidate the arguments as they apply to this particular demographic of people. And furthermore, um, they don't invalidate, or they, they have to stand up to a broader context where the criminal justice system has been proven to work in deeply racializing and classist ways. We cannot ignore the backdrop against which these policies are being rolled out. And that is a backdrop where certain kinds of demographics are being disproportionately targeted and penalized through some of the state's most punitive sanctions. not answer the why question, but thank you, Lucia, for your questions. Um, so your first short question was the question of whether the decision to label the Modern Slavery Act, the Modern Slavery Act, was a mistake. You mean from my point of view or from the point of view of, of, the, government. of the government? But your question is about whether I think it was a mistake yeah. to label it that way. Uh, I personally, yeah, absolutely. I think to appropriate and reappropriate the language of slavery which is not only the antithesis of liberalism, I mean, there's no crime worse than slavery in the liberal imagination, but to then also um, appropriate it in such a way that further cements white amnesia is, is a politically problematic act, to say the least. It was politically a, a very... Um, convenient act because how can you be against fighting slavery you know it's impossible to mobilize political protest against an agenda like this um, but it had hugely problematic consequences that allowed precisely for some of the things you've mentioned here a further blurring of the criminal law with you know the area of kind of pre-crime some of these things are not criminal offenses and yet we're kind of sneaking the language of the criminal law back in what does it do you know um, and this, I guess, leads me to the second uh, point about this list of criminality. Yeah, it's interesting what you mentioned. So some of these are already criminal offen offenses in themselves. Some of them are merely referring to kind of warning signs that, um, uh, that, that don't really have uh, a reality in the criminal law. So I'm just looking at, at some of them. Going missing from school or home, being found out of area. I mean, although that already raises safeguarding concerns. Should we keep the criminal law out of it, is your question. I think 
my personal um, opinion on this is yes, we absolutely should. The reason why I feel concerned about it is that because by introducing the criminal law into it, you're not just further validating the criminal law, but you're also allowing a whole host of other forms of behavior to become quasi-criminal categories. And I didn't um, have a chance to, to go into this, but what I notice in the feedback I've done with law enforcement is that they're using these quasi-criminal categories in their day-to-day -day lives all the time. So. I don't know, in one presentation I went to, um, an officer was talking about what they called mate crime, which is not a criminal offense, but it's the quasi-criminal category of describing a situation where an individual is exploited by somebody else who pretends to be their mate, their friend. Okay. Cuckooing, I'm sure you've heard of that. Another one of those quasi-criminal categories, right? Um, that, so that refers to a process whereby drug dealers are taking over the flats of typically kind of vulnerable drug users. And these terms are starting to be used like criminal um, categories, like the criminal law. And I think that is one of the effects that we're uh, moving ever more into this area of pre-crime, um, which is validated through the use of criminal law in some instances, but resulting in a situation where anything is certainly up for grabs. As to why this is happening, you tell me, maybe over wine. <laughs> um, I've seen two hands and I'm secretly queuing. Um, so there's three, <laughs> four now. Um, Rachel. Um, it's, that was so interesting, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask you a bit more about this uh, kind of tipping point and who, you know, who's defined as a, a victim and who's defined as, a, as an offender or a supporter here. And, and there were a couple of things that I really wanted to ask. It's something that I've wanted about and it, Justice workers recently, this is such a vivid narrative for how young people's offending is understood, especially if they're involved in drug stealing and so on. Um, and, uh, and I kind of have often wondered about the subjective judgments feeding into that, which is why your much more empirical analysis of this is so interesting, but how this is influenced by you know, who, the, who the definition of exploited is extended to, and how mm -hmm. it's certainly influenced by race and class and so on. But, um, in all of that, so what I kind of wondered in a way was uh, if you could say any more about the workings of the determination with the NRM, as far much as we know about it, how is that? How does that operate and what does that do? And I also wanted to ask about the intersection with age and given the criminal age of responsibility of 10. Um, is, it, is it a tipping point at the 18th birthday as well that we're talking about here? Is, there, is this working more, not effectively, I mean, there's enormous problems with it, but it, it is it being extended more readily to under 18 year olds and does it tipping point become when a young person has their 18th birthday yeah. which is problematic and these are sort of three bits of the same question so I hope you give me this uh, three part question but the other part was whether or not I've done as well with it um, the, in your research with mothers I was thinking particularly of the work of uh, Cookie's research associate here and I don't know if she's here I don't know if she is but has worked written quite a lot about uh, kind of maternal activism and charismatic matriarch figures that are much more likely to be given um, the kind of victim status or seen as suffering in various ways if they have certain characteristics and fit certain models and so on and, and as we know of certain mother figures like that have been very influential in the development of various criminal justice policies and laws and so on um, and I, so I wondered if there were parallel processes going on in how the mothers were being responded to and treated and whether they were being seen as kind of victims or ways out of families in the life. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your questions. So three questions, right? Sorry. No, that's okay. I just hope I, I, I remember them correctly. Your first question was um, about the subjective judgment that can feed into this question of whether somebody's a victim or has gone from victim, being a victim to becoming a perpetrator and how the NRM fits in with that. Yeah, I'm, so this is, I guess, one of the gaps of my research. Any research has gaps. I've tried to access the NRM and, um, you know, get into the door and see how decision makers come to their conclusions and I've failed. I haven't been given access. What I do have are transcripts of NRM decisions that were recited in courts and also those that barristers and social workers have shared with me. 
um, that give me some indication of how these decisions are reached. And I think one of the things to remember is that this is a discursive process in the making. It's such a new policy, right? I mean, these are people who are getting their head around using a completely new terminology, but applying it to a problem that they're deeply familiar with. I know the government say county lines is a new thing, but the problem of drug dealing and the kinds of relationships that you have at the bottom rung of the street economy, they're not new to, to anybody who works in the field. Um, and so this is where the subjective judgment, as you say, comes in. And you asked me in relation to that also to um, comment on age as one potential factor that might determine when the tipping point comes. Yeah, in, in the legislation, that is one of... So there's a difference in the legislation, for example, when it comes to the defense, to, to the exploitation defense, in terms of whether somebody's a minor or not. So legally, there is a difference. But also morally, in terms of people's own assessments, that, that was definitely one of the things that kept, kept coming in. But it was only one of many categories that people invoked to talk about whether someone was a victim or a perpetrator. So age was one, gender was another one. You know, I, I've been in criminal trials where all of the defendants were young men or teenage boys, and all of the so-called slaves or victims were their girlfriends. You know, and, and, and defense really, the defense lawyers really did their best to try and make the case that actually there was more going on than exploitation, reading out text messages of, you know, the stuff they got up to and the fun they were having. Um, so, yeah, gender was definitely one of those categories as well alongside age. And also previous um, histories of criminality was often used as a shorthand to explain if someone was a victim or an alpha victim. So people would often say, well, look at the history of criminal convictions. Obviously, they went from being a victim to becoming a perpetrator a long time ago. Um, and then you asked me about the maternal activism and whether there is a parallel process going on to one that we've seen historically where women were portrayed as, 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 as what, I, I'm not sure if I understood you correct, correctly, what you're saying is as legitimate sufferers, as victims who should be heard. I think I'm just thinking about the parallel processes. I was so interested in this tipping point, yeah. there are similar things going on in how mothers are With the mothers. So with certain characteristics. Oh, I see. They have a, a status. Yeah. And others don't. I, I mean, I think in general, and you can really, you can understand it to an extent from the point of view of professionals, but what I witnessed when I, whenever I was present um, and, and, and doing advocacy work is that you tended to go, to very quickly go from being considered a victim or someone who should be taken care of to a potential threat at that point where you started challenging official decisions. <laughs> You know, that's the tipping point when you become angry or when you become difficult, where your own lack of professional expertise um, gets emphasized in the room. So, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, first, that was a wonderful lecture. Thank, Thank you. So you. Much for um, I'm just wondering if, there's, if you've observed cases in which the defense has successfully yeah. thrown on their. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. I'm told by colleagues who work in criminal defense that it's becoming easier to run the modern slavery defense. But in the time that I spent in the courts and the trials that I followed, I have not come a single, across a single case where the exploitation defense was run successfully. Defense barristers tell me that this is partly because how do you explain to a jury that the young man in the dock who would typically go down for, for a crime should now be thought of as victims? They'd say, this is not what the public has in mind when you talk about victims or slaves. You know, it's too much of a, of a mental shift that you're asking the public to do. That's one of the reasons the kind of prevailing public culture, according to defense lawyers, that is hard to shift. Um, but one of the other reasons or problems is that often... In the cases that I was in, um, young people weren't just charged with drugs offences, but they were, they also had other uh, they, they were also facing trial uh, for other offences, like the joint enterprise murder case. The defence lawyer in that case actually tried to run the exploitation defence for the drugs charges that the 16-year-old kid had, but in a trial where he'd already been presented as a gang member, you know, who who should be found guilty of a joint enterprise murder. 
that modern slavery defense just doesn't, it doesn't work. You cannot tell a jury to set aside their considerations or concerns about um, murder and manslaughter on the one hand and just consider the slavery considerations when it comes to drug dealing on the other hand. So that's one of the other reasons why it's very difficult, I think, for defense lawyers to run the defense successfully. So I was struck by this. <laughs> that on, the, on the one hand, that there's clear, the, your argument seems to be that, in a sense, modern slavery is being mobilised in a project to kind of revalidate and re-legitimate both the British state as a whole and its various of its criminal justice institutions. But you're also very keen at various junctures to, to, to tell us that, that you're not trying to impute malign intent to anyone involved in this process. So, so my, my first question is, why, why not? Because oh, that's why... That's one interpretive possibility. And if, if you're right about that, <laughs> there's no malign intent going on, yeah. what, what, what's, what's happening here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. Is this in some sense uh, a kind of, however, inchoate a political project to do the thing you've described? <coughs> or really is this a series of institutional actors trying, trying in their own minds to do good and generating all sorts of unintended feedback effects? something which intensifies the kind of punitivity of the whole system and does something else as a kind of political effect. Yeah, you've kind of caught me out. <laughs> um, you're asking me why I'm not attributing malign intent. I'm also conscious of the audience and the fact that this is recorded. <laughs> and also conscious of the trust that people have given me, you know, and the genuine intentions that I've seen.